Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Nico Jenkins. Viewer discretion is advised. <gasps> oh my. Is that a treasure map tattooed on your neck? Bud? Hey, bud? <laughs> this part says the Holy Grail is at Area 51? You know what you remind me of? Wentworth Miller from Prison Break, baby. Mmm! <clears throat> Nico was born in Colorado, and he had a bit of a history with criminal behavior throughout his early years. One time he brought a gun to school, and before this story takes place, he had served 10 years of a 21-year sentence for carjacking. And he did that when he was just 15. Well, at this point, he is now living in Omaha, Nebraska. And on August 11th, 2013, he would begin a killing spree which was just two weeks after he was released from prison. He somehow managed to lure two men, Jorge Caiga Ruiz and Juan Uribe Peña, to an area with promises of having sexual relations with women. Both men were sitting in a white pickup truck when Nico Jenkins pulled out a gun, which was a 12-gauge shotgun, and he shot both men directly in the head. Juan Uribe was also shot in the genitals. Now, on August 19th, 2013, Curtis Bradford, someone that Nico Jenkins actually knew from prison. Well, Nico found him and gave him two shots to the back with the same shotgun. Then, on August 21st, 2013, his fourth and final victim, Andrea Kruger, she had just closed up the lounge she worked at called the Deja Vu, and she was on her way home when she had the unfortunate luck to run into Nico Jenkins. He randomly chose her, and shot her in the neck, the face, and one of her shoulders. On August 30th, 2013, Nico Jen Oh, Jesus. I can see he's taking it seriously. Nico was arrested for terroristic threats, which are apparently unrelated to the shootings. Now, the police already had surveillance footage that would tie Nico Jenkins to some of these killings. They also have evidence that someone in his life helped get him the weapon. But Nico here would claim to be insane. He said he was schizophrenic, he said he was bipolar, he said he had OCD, but a court-appointed psychiatrist would say, nah, you're faking that shit. They said he was faking his psychotic delusions. But he would still claim that he killed those four people because an ancient serpent god named Apophis instructed him to do so. The f***? On April 16th, 2014, he was found guilty of all four counts of murder. He was sentenced to death and also 450 years. You have a lot on your plate, sir. He appealed to SCOTUS, and they said, <laughs> Nope. <gasps> oh, hello, true crimeers. It's time for another episode of International Killers. And today, we're going to England. And I promise I won't do this butchered attempt at an accent for much longer. Viewer discretion is advised. I think I turned into Mrs. Doubtfire there at the end. I apologize to all of the United Kingdom and the Queen herself for that whatever-the-hell attempt at that accent that was. So, who is England's most prolific serial killer? Well, he also happens to be the world's most prolific serial killer. And his name is Dr. Harold Shipman, who kind of looks like Robin Williams circa Goodwill Hunting. Hey, it's not your fault. What? Well, Actually, no, it is your fault. This is all your fault, so. Harold Shipman was born on 14 January 1946 in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire, England. Little hairy boy here, he was really close to his mother, Vera. She would die of lung cancer when he was about 17, but through the course of her cancer, he had to witness her get morphine drips pretty often. And he would sort of use that morphine drip kind of concept, you know, a little bit later down the road in his life in a not-so-nice way. He graduated from Leeds School of Medicine in 1970. By 1974, he was a GP, or general practitioner. And then by the 80s, he would establish his own medical office. In March of 1998, one of Harold Shipman's colleagues, Linda Reynolds, who they worked together at the Brooks Surgery, well, she voiced concerns that a large amount of Harold Shipman's patients were dying. A lot. Like, a lot, a lot. And it was lining up with a whole bunch of cremation requests by Harold Shipman for those same deaths. Because once you cremate a human body, you can't test it for any kind of, you know, drugs or anything. And all of these patients, generally speaking, were elderly. 
At the time, police said, we don't have enough evidence, so they closed his case. And when they closed the case, Harold Shipman would kill three more people. A taxi driver would also come forward saying a larger man than the elderly people he dropped off at the hospital, who all appeared to be healthy, well, he never picked them up because a lot of them just died. And these were all patients of Dr. Harold Shipman. So by looking into about 12 to 15 of these elderly cases, it would be discovered that Harold Shipman was administering lethal doses of diamorphine. He then would sign their death certificates and forge the documents stating that all of these women were in poor health, hence why they died. But that was not true. If they had some kind of monitoring system, they would have noticed this pattern in the mid-90s, when there were 67 excess deaths. It's believed that Harold Shipman killed 218 people. He was convicted of 15 counts of murder and got 15 life sentences at HM Prison Wakefield. He hung himself. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Edward Wayne Edwards. Yeah, that's his real name. Viewer discretion is advised. Good old Edward Edwards here was born in 1933 in Akron, Ohio. Yep, that sounds about right. He claims he was abused by nuns during his upbringing because he was raised in an orphanage. Just a tick later in life, he would join the U.S. Marines, but then he would go AWOL and would be dishonorably discharged. Off to a good start so far. Around the mid-50s, he would impersonate Marines, to which he got arrested for this. And he was put in jail in Akron, Ohio. In 1955, he broke out of jail. He was reapprehended in 1956 after he burglarized a few places. In 1960, he broke out of jail again. And this time, he was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Maybe put a leash on him, fellas. He was caught again got 17 additional years, and he would eventually become paroled in 1967. And this is when he would become a serial killer. I mean, are you shocked his middle name is Wayne? Of course he's a serial killer. 1977, Ohio. William Billy Lavaco and his girlfriend, Judith Straub. Well, E-W-E, or E-W, Edward Wayne Edwards. Well, unfortunately for this couple, he would come across them robbed them and shot them both with a shotgun, killing them. 1980, you know, conquered Wisconsin. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Well, again, unfortunately for them, they came across Ew, and he would strangle and stab them to death. This case was labeled the Sweetheart Murders. Now, obviously, EWE, he wasn't caught for the first set of murders, and he wouldn't be caught for these murders for quite some time. 1996, Burton, Ohio. This is Danny Boy Edwards. Yes, again, that is his real middle name. He was the foster son to EWE. Well, his foster father would shoot him in the face for $250,000 of insurance money. Now, little side note, since you all know I'm a big fan of making a murderer, there is a popular theory going around that Edward Wayne Edwards is also the real killer of Teresa Halbach, the woman who was murdered that Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are now serving life sentences in Wisconsin for doing. Remember, Edward Wayne Edwards is familiar with Wisconsin. EWE was known for trying to frame other people for his murders, and it's widely believed that Stephen Avery was framed for the murder of Teresa Halbach. This is a scene from Making a Murderer. There in the background behind Kenneth the Walrus Kratz, many people speculate is in fact Edward Wayne Edwards. This is all mainly a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Thanks to DNA evidence, he would be caught in 2009. He was convicted of five murders and sentenced to death. But he would die of natural causes in Ohio in 2011. Ew. Oi! Hello, true crimeers! It's time for another episode of International Serial Killers. And today, we're going, if you can't tell by my near-perfect accent, we're going to Mexico. Oi, no. We're going to Scotland. All right. I'll probably stop this accent right now. It's likely offending a whole bunch of people. Oh. Scotland's most notorious serial killer is a, is a psycho named Peter Manuel. Peter would actually be born in New York City here in the States, but his parents were both from Scotland. They then lived in Detroit, Michigan for some time before eventually going on the way back to Scotland in 1932. Yeah, this is an old one. They moved to Birkenshire, Lanarkshire. When he was 16 years old, he actually sexually assaulted a just a string of women, and he was sentenced to prison for nine years. 
He then would defend himself later on in 1955, defend himself at his own trial, for another sexual assault uh, charge, which he won. Then, between the years of 1956 and 1958, he would graduate from sexual assaults to murder. He confessed to the murder of eight different people. Now, he would only be charged officially with seven murders because with the first murder he committed, there wasn't any, like, evidence to directly connect him to it. He first killed 17-year-old Ann Nylans, where he repeatedly beat her with an iron. This was in 1956. He would then kill Marion Watts, her daughter, Vivian Watts, and her sister, Margaret Brown. They were all shot dead in Burnside, Lanarkshire. He then went on to kill a taxi driver, a 36-year-old named Sidney Dunn, in Newcastle. This was in 1957. Also in 1957, he went on to kill another 17-year-old girl named Isabel Cook. He sexually assaulted her and then killed her by strangling her. And then finally, in January of 1958, he would then kill mother and father Peter and Doris Smart and their 10-year-old son, Michael Smart. They were all shot dead in Unikston. Now, he enjoyed some alone time in their house. He actually stayed at their house for a week after he murdered them. I should also mention he wasn't actually tried for the murder of uh, Sidney Dunn. This was allegedly because that murder took place outside of the jurisdiction. But then later down the road, they would determine that uh, he did actually kill Sidney Dunn. When he was arrested in 1958 and was charged with all of the murders, he would again defend himself in court. He would be his own attorney. One of the family murders he did, he actually tried to blame on the father, which that didn't work. In July of 1958, he was executed. He was hanged at the gallows. Last words, turn up the radio, I'll go quietly. Hello, true crimeers. This is a serial killer, and his name is Herbert Mullen. And, uh, sir, you have a piece of hair on your cheek, and it is really pissing me off. That's better. How do you guys like my new hair? All right, let's read about this piece of sh**. Herbie the pervy Mullen over here was born in 1947. I think horse and carriage was still being used back then, right? Who am I talking to? There's no one here. In high school, he was voted most likely to succeed. Well, he would, I guess, succeed at something. At being a little bit. Also in high school, one of his friends, Dean Richardson, died in a car accident. So he did what any normal high school student would do. He built a shrine to him in his bedroom. And then he would begin to fear that he was becoming a homosexual. Ugh, God. I hate this f When he was 21, he was committed to a mental hospital, where he then checked himself out. In 1972, he was living in Santa Cruz, California. The voices in his head, and yes, I mean that he literally thought the voices in his head, were telling him that an earthquake was about to happen. And only Herbert can stop the earthquake from happening by sacrificing humans. His birthday fell on April 18th, which is the same day in 1906 where the San Francisco earthquake happened. Herbert would say that the Vietnam War was offering plenty of blood sacrifice to stop earthquakes. But when the war started to come to a close, he believed it was up to him to continue the blood sacrifice. Oof, you a freak. Well, on October 13th, 1972, he would begin his blood sacrifice. He beat a 55-year-old homeless man named Lawrence White to death with a baseball bat. He would later claim that this particular victim was Jonah from the Bible. And that victim sent Herbert a telepathic message that said, Pick me up and throw me over the boat. Kill me so that others will be saved. October 1972, he would stab Mary Goyle to death. November 1972, he beat and stabbed through the heart Henry Tomai. January 1973, shot and stabbed Jim Gianera, and also Joan Gianera, and Kathy Francis, and her two boys Damon and David. February 1973, he shot David Olaker, as well as Robert Michael Spector, Mark John Drebelbis, Brian Scott Card, the last four were teenagers. His last victim was on February 13th, 1973, 72-year-old Fred Perez. He killed him in broad daylight. Plenty of witnesses saw it. They also saw his license plate. And he was caught really quickly. He then confessed to all of the crimes. He was found guilty of both first-degree and second-degree murders and got life in prison without parole. 
This is him now. Bye. Whoa, hello, true crimerers. This is the story of serial killer Robert Picton, or the Canadian pig farmer. We're in for a porkin' bad time. You know, I'll just go. Trigger warning, I'm about to show his picture. Hey. Hey, bud. Aren't you the guy with the weird hand from the scary movie movie? People Magazine's hottest guy of the year 2007, Robert Picton here. He was born on October 24th, 1949. And he was born in Port Coquitlam, which is in British Columbia, Canada. When Picton's parents were both dead in 1978, they had left him the family farm along with his two siblings. But only Robert, who was also known as Willie, because of course he was, he was the only one who really wanted to do anything with the farm. Picton was known as someone who kept to himself and seemed to have a quiet personality. On March 23, 1997, he would be charged with the attempted murder of a sex worker. She managed to escape, but the charges would end up being dismissed by 1998. The uh, Picton family would also be sued by Port Coquitlam because they were violating zoning laws, but they ignored it. One of the workers on the farm, whose name was Bill Hiscox, He would begin to notice that women who visited the farm seemed to disappear. In February of 2002, police executed a search warrant they had because they had information that there were illegal firearms on the property. Robert and his brother David were both arrested, and they also had a warrant to search the property as part of the British Columbia Missing Women's investigation, in which the farm, they found some of the women's items. Eventually, both brothers were released, but Robert Picton was surveilled by police. On February 22nd, 2002, Robert would be re-arrested, but this time for the murders of Serena Abbotsway and Mona Wilson. Then, by April, three more murder charges for Jacqueline McDonnell, Diane Rock, and Heather Bottomley. And then another murder charge on April 9th for the murder of Andrea Josbury. And then a seventh for the murder of Brenda Wolf. Things aren't looking good for you, bud. September 20th, four more murder charges. He would eventually be charged with 27 first degree murders. So they excavated the grounds on his property. They had evidence that Robert Picton would feed some of his victims to the pigs. Yep. They also had reason to believe that he mixed in human meat with the pork meats that he sold to people. The belief is that Robert Picton is responsible for the murders of at least 48 women, if not 49. Dudes, Captain Spaghetti hair up here is pretty f gross. He would be convicted for six of the murders. He got a life sentence. Hello, true crimeers. We're going across the seas today. This is the case of Peter Sutcliffe, or also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, we gonna talk about that on your head or what? Tell me you're a kid and play cosplayer without telling me you're a kid and play cosplayer. Are your eyes different? Oh, this be hitting different. Peter Sutcliffe was born on 2nd June 1946 in Bingley, West Riding of Yorkshire, England. He abandoned school when he was 15 years old. He then worked as a grave digger. Gee, I wonder why. He was also known to be hiring some of the prozies. Ladies of the night, you know? Why am I doing this hand thing? I'm not whispering. In August of 1974, he would marry his lady, Sonia. They tried to have babies, but she was unable to. She would also cheat on her husband, Peter. That always ends up well. But for most of his life, he was just a pretty normal dude. He didn't show any real signs of the issues he would later have, with the exception of being kind of obsessed with prostitutes. Who isn't? In 1969, this creeper would assault his very first Lady of the Night. He beat her over the head with a rock that was in a sock. Now, the woman didn't want to press any charges because she just wanted to be done with it. And then he was a good little boy until 1975. He would attack a couple more women, and a little more violently this time. He used a hammer to beat them over the head, and he even slashed one of them in the back with a knife. Luckily, these victims managed to survive. But then 13 women, 12 of them pictured here, they would not be so lucky. He would meet these women, most of them being ladies of the night, 
His preferred murder tool was a hammer. What he liked to do was beat them over the head with a hammer until they were either unconscious or d dead. And then after that, he would then just stab them, cut their throats. He would mutilate their bodies, essentially, with some sort of sharp instrument. Not only would he go on to murder 13 women, but he injured seven more women. Women who managed to survive being hammered over the head. So, he had the two first victims who survived, his tester women, I guess, then the 13 women he killed, and then the seven women sprinkled in between that he attacked and they managed to survive. He had 22 total confirmed victims, and his crime spree ranged from 1975 to 1980. On January 2nd, 1981, he was caught by police after he solicited a prostitute, and evidence would link him to the murders. In 1981, he was found guilty and sentenced to life, where then he would go on to write Game of Thrones. <laughs> I mean... Hello, true crimers. This is the case of serial killer Oscar Ray Bolin. Don't worry, I will be nothing but respectful to him, because he is a human being with feelings, and I would never want to bully a serial killer. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, look how happy he is. He was born on January 22nd, 1962 in Portland, Indiana. Now the kind of interesting thing about him, he basically lived most of his young life in the carnival circuit. His family was like carnival workers. So he got to see a lot of cool shit and a lot of weird shit. And his father beat him and his mother emotionally scarred him. One time she walked him to the school bus and put a leash on him. Now, in 1987, Bolin here, well, he decided to kidnap a woman with a couple of guys. This happened in Toledo, Ohio, and she was a 20-year-old waitress. Now, him, plus the other two men, repeatedly sexually assaulted the woman, and their intent was to kill her, but the gun they had malfunctioned. So they just let her go, which then led to his arrest. This, this arrest. He and his friends were actually convicted of kidnapping and sexual assault. He was given 22 to 75 years in prison. Well, in 1989, his ex-wife, who's now remarried, she spilled the beans on something pretty horrific. On January 25th, 1986, a 25-year-old church's chicken manager named Natalie Blanche Hawley was kidnapped. And this was in Tampa, Florida. A few hours later, her body was found. She had been stabbed multiple times. Bolin's ex-wife said she helped dispose of the evidence. His ex-wife also knew about the murder of another woman. On November 5th, 1986, 17-year-old Stephanie Collins, well, she would vanish after a work shift. A month later, her body was found wrapped in this sheet. Bolin had told his ex-wife about the murder. But wait, there's more. On December 5th, 1986, 26-year-old Terry Lynn Matthews, guess what? She went missing. Her body was found later that day. Her throat had been slashed. One of Bolin's cousins, guess what? He confessed to helping kill Terry Lynn Matthews. By the way, while he's in prison, he gets married to a woman who was on his defense team. And they were a happy couple until the very end. Which was on January 7th, 2016. Oscar Bolin was indicted in Florida as he was serving prison for the other crimes. He would go on to be convicted of three capital murders and got three life sentences. These three women got their justice. He was executed in Florida by lethal injection. Oh, hello, true crimeers. This is the brutal case of Richard Speck. The Speckster here was born on December 6, 1941 in Kirkland, Illinois. You look like a news anchor in this photo, and I don't like that. Speck grew up in a slightly normal, but also slightly troubled home. He had issues throughout school. By age 12, he was already drinking, and he was an alcoholic by age 15. In July of 1963, he kind of got involved with the law when he forged a co-worker's paycheck for only $44. He also robbed stores, and he was given a three-year prison sentence for these crimes. Just a week after he was paroled for those crimes, in 1965, he chased down and tried to attack a woman with a butcher knife. She managed to get away, and he got arrested. He got 16 more months in prison. Basically, little things like this, they were adding up throughout his life. 
On the late Chicago evening of July 13, 1966, Richard Speck would break into a townhouse that was actually housing um, nurses. It, it was essentially a dormitory for nursing students. The women inside included Corazon Amirau, Gloria Jean Davy, Suzanne Ferris, Marlita Gargulo, Mary Ann Jordan, Patricia Matusik, Valentina Pazion, Nina Jo Schmale, and Pamela Wilkening, all of them between the ages of 20 and 24. When Speck broke into the home, he forced three of the women by gunpoint into a back bedroom where he discovered three more women. He used torn up bed sheets to tie them all up, and he bound both their hands and their feet. Now, he told the women, I'm just here to rob you, that's it. He was sh drunk because he had been drinking at several different bars throughout Chicago. At midnight, three more nurses came home, so he took a gun to them and tied them all up as well. So now he has nine women captive. Then he would take each woman one by one into a separate room, where he would then either strangle that woman to death or he would stab them to death. Roughly 20 to 30 minutes in between each woman, so the women just in the other room could hear them as they were literally dying. They could hear their muffled screams and cries for help as they died. So he did this to all of them. The final woman he brought into the room, who was Gloria Davy, he sexually assaulted her before he then strangled her to death. These nurses were best friends. They had a great time, they loved each other's company, and they were all just so excited for the prospect of a new career in medicine, only to have it all snuffed away by a monster. Speck left fingerprints everywhere. He also left a witness. Corazon Amurao managed to escape death because she hid under a bed and Speck likely lost count of who was there. Speck would eventually get eight life sentences. It would all end on July 23rd, 1997, when a spree killer ended his own life in a Miami Beach boathouse. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Andrew Cunanan, and I gotta do this one quick. There's a lot. So growing up, Andrew was known to be a liar, a manipulator. He would spin wild tales to make himself look cooler. He one time even said that he met fashion designer Gianni Versace. He'll come up a little bit later. Andrew would come out as gay in high school, and he would become infatuated with older men. In his adult life, he would manipulate older gay men, you know, for their money. In December of 1995, Andrew met a man by the name of David Madsen, and they would end up having a long-distance relationship. But David quickly realized that something was off with Andrew. So in 1996, he called off their relationship, even though Andrew said that he was the love of his life. Andrew also had a friend who was a former Navy officer by the name of Jeffrey Trail. But it got to a point where their friendship was just too much. And when Andrew said, hey, I'm going to go out to Minneapolis to see you, Jeffrey reportedly told his sister and his friends like, oh my God, I don't want Andrew here. Oh my God, he can't come here. Jeffrey had recently found out that Andrew was selling drugs. In fact, he was also addicted to painkillers and alcohol. He just didn't want any of that in his life. But Andrew went out there anyway. Andrew arrived in Minneapolis in April of 1997. He stayed at Jeffrey Trail's apartment while Jeffrey was actually out vacationing with his boyfriend. And Jeffrey had told his boyfriend, like, I have to have a really serious conversation with Andrew. But when they got back from vacation, Andrew was gone from the apartment. And that's because Andrew had then gone to stay with his friend David Madsen, who also was out there in Minneapolis. Andrew and Jeffrey ended up having a very heated conversation. They got into a fight. And then on April 27th, 1997, Andrew would lure Jeffrey to David's apartment. When Jeffrey walked in the door, Andrew was hiding behind it and he would bash his skull in with a hammer. He would then roll up his dead body in a carpet and hide it behind David's couch. Police would later find Andrew's bloody shoe print. Andrew would then take David hostage and then eventually kidnap him, take him on a road trip in David's car. They got to a place near Rush Lake in Minnesota where Andrew would take out a gun and shoot David three times, killing him. Andrew then took David's car, drove to Chicago, where he met a real estate tycoon by the name of Lee Miglin, and Andrew would torture him. Stabbed him 20 times, he slit his throat with a hacksaw, and then stole his car. Andrew then drove to New Jersey, where he came across a cemetery caretaker named William Reese. Andrew would shoot him dead and steal his car. And then by July 15th, 97, 
He got to Miami Beach, Florida. He walked up to Gianni Versace's house. He was outside collecting his newspaper, and Andrew shot him in the back of the head. He then ended his own life. In 1979, in Atlanta, Georgia, a string of murders would begin. Do they have the real killer? Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Atlanta Child Murders. Viewer discretion is advised. On July 28, 1979, the bodies of two young men, Edward Hope Smith, pictured here, and Alfred Evans, pictured here, they were both 14 years old, and they had both gone missing several days prior. They were both shot dead with a 22 caliber bullet, and they were both found discarded in a wooded area. On September 4th, another body of another 14-year-old boy was found. October 21st, a nine-year-old boy's body would be found. This pattern of discovering the bodies of young men who had gone missing, it just kept piling up. And for a while, it was just typically males. But on March 4th, 1980, they would find the first female body, a 12-year-old girl by the name of Angel Lanier. By May of 1981, they had discovered the bodies of 28 children and two adults. This is most of them. It was believed that these were all victims from the same person who would be nicknamed the Atlanta Monster, or sometimes referred to as the Atlanta Child Killer. After one of the bodies was discovered, police would get this note. Please stop forced busing or I will kill three more black boys in Atlanta in March. Yes, every single victim was African American. Eventually, they got another note, and this time the Zodiac was claiming this. Or someone claiming to be the Zodiac, claiming to be the murderer. Hello, it's me. Haven't you people figured out who is killing these little people yet? I'll give you a hint. I used to be in San Francisco. I used to stalk women, but I like to kill children now. They utilized over 100 agents to investigate this crime spree. Curfews were put into place. Children were not allowed to leave their homes anymore. Children were afraid to literally go anywhere, thinking they could be next. On June 21st, 1981, a man by the name of Wayne Williams was arrested. He was linked to the two adult murders. Both of those victims were 22 years old. They were able to trace fibers back to Williams that had been found on several of the other child victims. Some of the kids were strangled with cords, cords that Wayne Williams also had, but none of that definitively linked him to it. In February of 1982, Wayne Williams was convicted of the two adult murders. He was given two life sentences without parole. To this day, it is believed he is the Atlanta child killer, but that's never been made official. Do you know this boy? Do ya? You probably don't. Come on in close, and I'll let you know who he is. Oh, hello, true crimers. This is the case of Peter Woodcock slash David Michael Kruger. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, in order to talk about this young fella here, we gotta go up north to Canada, you know. Peter was born on March 5th, 1939. One month into his young life, his birth mother just gave him up. And then he would be placed into the foster system where he would bounce around from home to home to home. And unfortunately, this would create some psychological issues. I'm sorry, doesn't he kind of look like Andrew Cunanan a bit? Sadly, Peter was also physically abused by at least one set of foster parents to a point where his neck was so badly injured he had to be hospitalized. And we're talking as like a two-year-old. He would develop a fear of people, understandable. He developed a speech problem. But when he was three years old, he found his permanent home. This one right here, it was the home of Frank and Susan Maynard, a couple who did well for themselves. And by all accounts, they treated Peter wonderfully. Peter, however, would be bullied by neighborhood kids. Worried about his health and his mental state, they would check him into the hospital for sick children, but it just didn't seem to work. He would have violent thoughts that he would say out loud, like, I wish a bomb would fall and kill all of these children. That's an actual quote from him. Peter would love to ride around on his bike. 
and pretend he had a gang. And then he would make his sick fantasies become reality. On September 15th, 1956, when Peter was 17 years old, he would lure seven-year-old Wayne Millette to a quiet location and strangle him to death. There were bite marks left on his body, and Peter had left a... He went number two, right next to the body. October 1956, he would kill nine-year-old Gary Morris. He strangled and beat him to death. And again, there were bite marks on his body. January 1957, he would kidnap four-year-old Carol Voice. She was strangled to death and sexually assaulted. And he left a tree branch inside of her. This would be a composite drawing they drew about the assailant. Peter was quickly caught. He would be deemed clinically psychotic, and he was acquitted by reason of temporary insanity, but was put into a mental institution. In 1991, he and this guy killed a fellow patient, and he died while institutionalized. A drifter would use the railroad systems throughout Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and he would become one of the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Angel Maturino Resendiz, otherwise known as the Railroad Killer. Viewer discretion is advised. He was born in Puebla, Mexico in 1959, and he would eventually go by many, many, many names. The primary name that most people knew him by was Rafael Resendez Ramirez. Now, he would illegally hop aboard trains that would go up and down the United States, which is where he primarily spent his time. But he did cross the border to Canada and then also went back to Mexico at times. On August 28th, 1997, 21-year-old Christopher Maillar, he was walking with his girlfriend, Holly Dunn, and this was in Kentucky, and this is Holly here, when the railroad killer, as we'll just call him, he attacked the couple. Christopher was beaten and stabbed to death. Holly was beaten, stabbed, and sexually assaulted, but she would survive. He would use Holly's belt to tie her up, but she eventually freed herself. Now this attack happened right along the railroad tracks. This killer would always stick by the railroad tracks so he had an easy getaway. December 17th, 1998. 39-year-old Dr. Claudia Benton in Texas she was sexually assaulted, beaten, and stabbed to death. May 2nd, 1999, Norman and Karen Cernick, also in Texas, they were both bludgeoned to death by a sledgehammer at the United Church of Christ, where Norman was a pastor. And again, the church was right by a railroad track. October 2nd, 1998, 87-year-old Leafy Mason, also in Texas, she was bludgeoned to death with an antique iron. June 4th, 1999, 26-year-old teacher Noemi Dominguez, she was bludgeoned to death with a pickaxe. Also on June 4th, 1999, 73-year-old Josephine Convica, also in Texas, she was bludgeoned to death with the same pickaxe that Noemi Dominguez was. June 15th, 1999, now he's in Illinois, 79-year-old George Morber and his 51-year-old daughter, Carolyn Frederick, were shot and bludgeoned to death. Police piece together that this killer is using the railroads. He also left palm prints and fingerprints at every crime scene. And that's when he became one of the FBI's top 10 most wanted. On July 12, 1999, at the behest of his sister, he would turn himself in. He was only put on trial for the murder of Claudia Benton. He was convicted and sentenced to death. He confessed to several other murders. He was executed in 2006. Getting a ride from a stranger through Uber or Lyft is supposed to be safe. Well, in this particular story, it was not. Hello, true crimers. This is the case. Nobody likes me. Me some no lies. Jason Brian Dalton. Viewer discretion? You know it. It's advised. Now, this particular tale takes place in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And in the early evening hours of February 20th, 2016, Jason would create some chaos. A few ticks after 4 p.m., Jason Dalton, who is an Uber driver, would get a pickup request from a man named Matt Mellon. 
So Matt was picked up at 4.21 p.m. by Jason in his gray Chevy Equinox. Now, according to Matt and several witnesses, at some point during this drive to Matt's friend house, because that was the destination, Jason would start driving like a crazy person. He drove through a median. He turned a blind eye to stop signs and yield signs. He sideswiped a vehicle. And then he stopped the car at a stop sign. I guess only some stop signs need to be followed. So at that point, Matt jumps out of the car, calls 911. Now, 911 had already received a few calls about this lunatic driving like a madman. So they put a bolo out on Jason and his Equinox. Equinox? How do you say it? At 5.15 p.m., he accepts another Uber customer. And it's a woman who's requesting to be picked up from this apartment complex called Richland Township. He pulled up to someone and asked her if she was the person that he was looking for. She said no. So he goes around and comes back, pulls out a gun, and then begins firing. The woman was hit, but she did survive. Now, Jason would go home, talk to his wife. He gave her a gun and said, you're not safe, so keep this on you. He then took her black Chevrolet HHR, and now he's cruising the streets again. At 10.01 p.m., he arrives at a car dealership, gets out of his car, walks up to two random strangers, and he begins firing. He shoots 18 bullets, and he kills two men. Roughly 10 minutes later, he's now at a Cracker Barrel about five miles away from the car dealership. He approaches a white van, and he begins firing again. He killed four more people in this parking lot. These are the six people he killed that night, and then he wounded two others. His motive was that the app Uber, it took over his mind like the devil. The app controlled him. He was arrested and eventually he pled guilty to all of it. He got life in prison without parole. Hello, true crimers. This is the disappearance of Zeb Quinn. Fewer discretion is advised. This story takes place in Asheville, North Carolina, when Zeb was 18 years old. On the night of January 2nd, 2000, Zeb was finishing up his shift at Walmart. He would clock out sometime around 9 p.m. Now, a day or so prior to his shift here at Walmart, he had made arrangements to meet someone um, that night to buy a new car. And the plan was to meet that person in Leicester in North Carolina. Joining Zeb that night is my evil doppelganger, Robert Jason Owens, a friend of his who worked at Walmart with him. He was also a mechanic. Sir, you have three first names in your name, and that's just rude. At approximately 9.15 that evening, CCTV footage from a convenience store would show Zeb and Robert entering and then also leaving without incident. Zeb was driving his Mazda Protégé, and Robert was driving his own vehicle. At some point during the drive, Robert claims that Zeb pulled to the side of the road because he had gotten a page on his pager. Look it up, young people. So Zeb went to a nearby cell phone to check the reason for the page. And that's when Robert says Zeb got really frantic and then he just sped off. And in the process, Zeb allegedly rear-ended Robert's vehicle. And that's the last time Robert claims to have seen him. Now, Robert would go to the hospital that same night with fractured ribs and a head injury. He claims he got into another car accident that same night. What are the odds? Now, Zeb, pictured here with his sister, would never be seen again. He just vanished. So, the following day, his mother filed a missing persons report. A couple of days later, the Walmart that Zeb worked at got a phone call, apparently from Zeb, calling out of work. The co-worker said that didn't sound anything like Zeb. It would soon be revealed the person who called was actually Robert. He said it was because Zeb asked him to do so. Okay. On January 6th, so a few days later, Zeb's Mazda protege was found at the parking lot at a barbecue place. On the back window, written in lipstick, were painted lips with an exclamation point, and also in the car was an alive Labrador puppy. What? Now, most people were pretty suspicious of Robert but there really wasn't any evidence to charge him with anything until 2015, when Robert murdered three people. Food Network star Christy Schoen, her husband, J.T. Codd, and their unborn child. He struck them with his car and then dismembered them. 
Robert was convicted of that. Now authorities searched Robert's property. They found buried clothing items and bone fragments. So he was charged with Zeb's murder, but he's still awaiting trial and there's no motive. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> he's a spree kid. No. He's a mass mur No. He's a serial killer? All of the above? I don't even know. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the creepily mustachioed man, Roger Dale Stafford. Viewer discretion. It's advised. <laughs> Good old piece of garbage Roger here was born on November 4th, 1951 in Sheffield, Alabama. Not a whole lot's known about your life before your crimes, but you know what, who cares? On January 12th, 1974, Roger would enter a McDonald's, and this was in Muscle Shows, Alabama. Unfortunately, I cannot find a photo of the man I'm about to talk about. But at the McDonald's that night was a 21-year-old assistant manager. His name was Jimmy Earl Bailey. Roger forced him to open the safe, stole close to $1,400, and then shot Jimmy four times, killing him. Now, that murder would go unsolved for four years. Pictured here, of course, is Roger, his wife, Verna, and his brother, Harold. On June 22nd, 1978, Verna would flag down a family. They pretended to be broken down on the side of a highway. And by the way, this is taking place in Purcell, Oklahoma. I think that this right here is Melvin Perez. Well, he was with his family, his wife, Linda, and then their 12-year-old son, Richard. They were on their way to Melvin's mother's funeral. They wouldn't make it because this little trio here tricked the family into pulling over to help them. When the family pulled over, they robbed them and killed all three of them, shot them dead and then just left them on the side of the road. July 16th, 1978, they are not done. They drove their way to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they stopped at Sirloin Stockade. As the employees were closing the building, Roger got out of the car, went to the back door, knocked on it, and when the manager opened, Roger put a gun to his face and forced him back inside. They forced him to open the drawers in the safe, and then, According to what a witness would say later, the manager began to taunt Roger, Verna, and Harold. All three of them were in the building, by the way, now. This cost them their lives, allegedly. He forced the five employees into the freezer where Roger and Harold shot all of them to death. A couple of weeks later, Harold here died in a horrific motorcycle accident. Oh, rats. Roger then called the police while he was drunk. He confessed to all of these murders, and Verna testified against him. She got multiple life sentences. He was sentenced to death. He was executed in 1995. Oh, hello, guy. And hello, true crimers. This is the case of this guy. What's your name, fella? This is the case of Charles Schmid, also known as the Pied Piper of Tucson. Viewer discretion is advised. Charlie here. Can I call you Charlie? I'm going to call you Charlie. Chucky here was born on July 8th, 1942 in Tucson, Arizona. But his parents didn't want him, so they gave him up for adoption. And so Charles and Catherine Schmid adopted him. Yes, his adopted father was also named Charles. His new parents operated the Hillcrest Nursing Home in Tucson. Charles didn't really take to school that well. He didn't excel in any subject. But he was an excellent athlete, and he also had his dashing good looks. You have like a wannabe Elvis thing going, and I don't like it. He was also into... Hey, uh... He was into disguises. He used makeup to give himself a fake mole, and whatever the Christ that is with his nose. He would stretch out his lower lips to give him an Elvis Presley look. Well, Chuck suddenly got a wild hair up his buttocks. He wanted to know what it was like to murder someone. Literally, he wanted to thrill kill anyone, which is something that seemed to come out of nowhere. I mean, he did have problems throughout high school, like he stole things, but like never was he violent. This was fellow high school student Aline Rowe. 
Charles managed to convince her to hang out with him and his girlfriend, Mary French, and one of his best friends, John Saunders. They took her out to the Arizona desert. Mary sat in their car while John and Charles beat Aline to death with a rock. She, of course, was reported missing, but she wasn't found for some time. Another one of Charles's girlfriends, Gretchen Fritz, well, Charles decided to tell her what he did to Aline. And then he feared, uh-oh, what if she tells on me? So Charles drove Gretchen and her kid sister, Wendy, to the desert and murdered them. Both. I, I don't even know why the sister had to be involved. He then brought one of his friends, Richard Bruns, to the body to show what he did. And knowing Charles's history, Richard fled to Ohio. But then he came back and he told authorities everything that Charles had done. He even ratted out Mary French and John Saunders. In 1967, they found the body of Aline. The three of them went on trial. Mary got five years. John got life without parole. Charles was sentenced to death. But in 1975, he was stabbed 40 times by fellow inmates and died. Blockbuster Video is a ghost town now! <clears throat> I see most of you probably don't even know what this is. <laughs> Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Leon Dorsey. Viewer discretion is advised. No, you're not seeing duplicates. I have covered another blockbuster video murder as well as a Hollywood video murder. But believe it or not, there are others. It was the night of April 4th, 1994. There were two employees still remaining inside the blockbuster video, which was in Dallas, Texas. Those employees were 20-year-old Bradley Lindsay and the 26-year-old assistant manager, James Armstrong. Sometime shortly before midnight, Leon Dorsey would enter the Blockbuster. Yes, some were open that late. And he would immediately rob the two men. He forced them to the back office. And this is the actual CCTV still image from the back room where he was forcing them to open up the safe. Now, allegedly, most of this crime was captured on the CCTV camera, but back in the day, it was just a series of still images. It wasn't like actual moving, you know, video. Now, at some point, James Armstrong tried to flee, but Leon did not like that, so he shot him. And it was with a 9mm pistol. At that point, Brad Lindsay was now a witness to murder, so Leon Dorsey shot him dead as well. He stole a grand total of $400 from a register. $400 is what two men's lives cost. Now, at some point, he was actually questioned by police due to some witness testimony, but they didn't have anything to really hold him on, so they had no choice but to release him. On September 1st, 1994, now in Ellis County, Texas, Leon finds his way into a convenience store. And there he finds 51-year-old Hyun Suk Chan. He then was going to force her to open up the safe and steal the money. But for some reason, he just shot her in the back of the head and killed her. This time, police questioned him again and found out he had a 9mm handgun. The ballistics would come back to being the exact weapon that killed Mrs. Chan and the exact pistol that killed the two men at the Blockbuster. He maintained his innocence, but again, he was caught on camera from several angles. However, it wouldn't be until 1998 that he actually would confess to the murders. He was convicted and sentenced to death. And on August 12th, 2008, he was executed by lethal injection. Thrill killers are by far the most terrifying type of murderer to me. Killing for no reason and with reckless abandon. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Eric Royce Leonard. Viewer discretion is advised. On the evening of February 12th, 1991, in Sacramento, California, at a quick stop convenience store, three people would be shot dead. The victims were 35 year old Stephen Anderson, he worked there, 22 year old Zayed Ahmad Obeid, he also worked there, and then a 42 year old customer named Tor Johnson. When police began their investigation, they found out that a woman left the convenience store at approximately 10.39 p.m. after she bought, like, a magazine. 
They also noticed that rung up on the register were two 99 cent items that were never actually paid for. They noticed like a couple of bucks was stolen out of the register. Now the two employees were inside and Tor Johnson, he had been shot outside the convenience store as he was walking up to it. Given the fact that nothing was really stolen and the fact that none of these victims had any kind of, you know, enemies or, or reasons to be killed, Police quickly suspected that this was literally just someone who wanted to murder people. And they thought to themselves, well, this could very well happen again. And it did. Just a week later, on February 19th, 1991, three employees of a round table pizza, wow, I haven't heard of them in forever. Well, they were trying to close up the store for the night. And those employees were 30-year-old Andrea Coladangelo, 18-year-old Sarah Crook, and 20-year-old Kyle Reynolds. Now, the victims from the convenience store and the victims from the round table pizza were all killed with the same weapon, a 25 caliber Beretta pistol. The round table pizza was less than a mile away from where the convenience store was. In this situation, um, Andrea's purse was stolen and again, a couple of bucks from the till. Authorities believe this was just meant to throw them off, that the perpetrator's goal wasn't to steal money, it was just to kill people. He was nicknamed the Sacramental Thrill Killer. Now, 22-year-old Eric Royce Leonard had been questioned originally because he was spotted by witnesses in both locations. In fact, he only lived half a block away from the convenience store. He didn't have an alibi, but for some reason he was never actually arrested for the six murders at the time. But then an episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired that showed the case. And two weeks later, Eric Royce Leonard was finally arrested. And this was in May of 1991. Basically, his dad would rat him out, saying that he confessed to the killings. He tried to say he was cuckoo kachu. The jury didn't believe it. In 1996, he was sentenced to death. And he is still awaiting that sentence to be carried out. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of... <laughs> Holy sh**. Something, something, something dark side. This is the case of Larry Murphy. Yeah. Viewer discretion is strongly advised, because, you know. So, oh, Larry. Larry's kind of a bad dude. No, he's really a bad dude. He was born sometime in 1966 in Glenealy, which is in County Wicklow, Ireland. So let's start with what actually got him imprisoned. So in February 2000, God, it's so beautiful there. This is the Wicklow Mountains area in Ireland. He came across a woman whose name has not been revealed. Well, and he just... He took her. He just snatched her. He threw her into the trunk of his Toyota Corolla. Oh, Larry. He would drive her to County Kildare, where he took her out of the trunk, and he sexually assaulted her. And while he was doing this, he was also hitting her and beating her. He then threw her back in the trunk again, went back to the Wicklow Mountains, where he took her out of the trunk and sexually assaulted her again. <sighs> When she became, uh, I guess, combative, he decided to put a plastic bag over her head and he closed it so that she would suffocate. Thankfully, there were two people nearby. They recognized Larry. So he released the grip of the bag and he bolted on foot. The two men, again, thank God they were there, saved that woman's life. She went to police right away. And by the following morning, Larry Murphy was arrested. He openly admitted to it. He showed no remorse. And he even said that the girl was lucky that she was alive. So he pleaded guilty to, you know, sexual assault and attempted murder. And he was only sentenced to 15 years, in which he only served 10. And then he was released. And ever since, he's apparently just bounced around from, like, Spain and London and... Now, Larry Murphy, because of the crime he committed that got him arrested, he is now suspected in at least eight other crimes, all involving missing women. So this is known as Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. Between 1993 and 1998, eight different women went missing. Annie McCarrick, Ava Brennan, Imelda Keenan, Jojo Dullard, Fiona Pender, Ciara Breen, Fiona Sinat, and Deidre Jacob. These are the faces of those women. And I believe the woman he went to jail for is pictured here somewhere as well. He's most connected to the case of Deidre Jacob. She was 18 years old. 
and also to Annie McCarrick, a case that I covered before on this page. While he was in jail, no other disappearances like it happened, but as of now, he just remains as a person of interest. Behind me are the faces of eight women that we will never, ever get back. And they were taken away for what? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Michael Bruce Ross. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael Ross here was born on July 26, 1959, and he lived in Putnam, Connecticut. He had three siblings, and the family lived on a farm in Connecticut. His mother, well, she wasn't so great. There were accusations that she physically abused all of the kids. She was clearly very mentally unstable, and she abandoned the family on numerous occasions. But he was always helping on the family farm. He went to Killingly High School? Killingly. Okay. Where he kind of just coasted by, didn't really stand out. He eventually would become an insurance salesman, so woo! Michael had issues socializing with people. He wasn't great at it. He didn't really know how to talk to girls, so he would stalk them. The stalking then turned into something worse. In 1981, he would sexually assault a woman. She survived, um, but many women after would not. Pictured here are the faces of eight women. 25-year-old Zyung Nook Tu, 17-year-old Tammy Williams, 16-year-old Paula Pereira, 23-year-old Deborah Smith Taylor, 19-year-old Robin Stavinsky, 14-year-old April Brunez, 14-year-old Leslie Shelley, and 17-year-old Wendy Barabolt. Wendy Barabolt was killed in 1984. Now, witnesses saw a very particular car driving around the neighborhood right where Wendy was that day. So police were able to track down the vehicle and it would lead them straight to Michael Ross. At the time of his arrest, he was 25 years old. He would become known later down the road as the Roadside Strangler. He essentially targeted women who were walking down a road on their own. He felt they were the easiest victims and he couldn't suppress his urges, so... He actually killed two of the women in New York. He would sexually assault all of them, and then he would strangle them to death. When he was arrested, he had a come-to-Jesus moment. He found his religion, and he just openly confessed to all of the murders. He would only be tried for six of the murders, the ones in Connecticut. He was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Michael wanted the death penalty. He actually fought to have it come sooner even with many people opposing the death penalty there. But the execution took place. It took place in 2005, and it was the last that Connecticut ever did. Connecticut's death penalty has since been repealed. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as the Bathtub Killer. Viewer discretion is advised. Here at this apartment complex in Arlington, Texas, on September 17th, 1996, a young woman would be discovered dead in her apartment. 26-year-old Christine Vu would be discovered by her boyfriend um, when he tried to get into her apartment, but she didn't answer. When he managed to finally get in, he found her lying face down in the bathtub. The tub was about halfway full of water. She had duct tape around her ankles, around her wrists, and around her throat. The coroner would rule that she had been sexually assaulted, um, there was an attempt to strangle her, and then she was drowned. Near the crime scene, they did find a foreign fingerprint, meaning it did not match Christine, it did not match her boyfriend, or anyone else in her life. The fingerprint plus the DNA sample they found as well did not match anyone in their database. And then two months later, at the exact same apartment complex, right as the police are in the middle of still investigating Christine Vu's unsolved murder, another woman is found. 20-year-old Wendy Prescott was supposed to go on a shopping trip with her aunt and uncle, but when she didn't show up, which was very unusual for her and they couldn't get a hold of her, they went to her apartment. Once inside, they found her body in the bathtub with duct tape around her ankles, her wrists, and her throat. She was also sexually assaulted Again, she was in the bathtub, which was halfway full of water, and her cause of death was strangulation. 
there was a really solid fingerprint left behind at her crime scene and also male DNA. But again, it did not match anyone in her life and it did not match anyone in their systems. So the media would nickname him the bathtub killer for obvious reasons. Two years after Wendy's murder, another woman was attacked. February 23rd, 1999, a University of Texas student, Chima Benson, she was sexually assaulted, but she managed to fight back to a point where he beat her to she was unconscious, but he didn't kill her. Finally, in the summer of 2000, the fingerprint would come back with a match. Fingerprints from both crime scenes would come back to match Dale Chanette. This is because he was finally in the system for other crimes. The DNA went on to match him. His surviving victims all identified him. And in 2003, he was put on trial for the Wendy Prescott murder, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. They never put him on trial for the other murder. His crimes were just sexually motivated, and he's a creep. And in 2009, he was executed by lethal injection. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the monster of Miramichi. Viewer discretion is advised. This... <laughs> I'm sorry, I like immediately saw Nicolas Cage. This monster is Alan Legere. He was born and raised in New Brunswick, Canada. For most of his teenage and young adult life, he was in and out of jail, you know, committing burglaries and just little th things here and there. On June 21st, 1986, with the help of Todd Matchett and Scott Curtis, they broke into a convenience store. And this was also in New Brunswick, Canada. Inside the convenience store were the owners, John and Mary Glendening, who I cannot find pictures of, unfortunately. But they were an elderly couple. The three men proceeded to beat both of them. And then Mary was sexually assaulted. When she woke up, she noticed her husband was dead. He had been beaten to death. Alan Legere and his accomplices were actually caught fairly quickly. Now, all three of them would be sentenced for the murder. And now we part ways with you two. You're out of the story now. Bye! On May 3rd, 1989, Alan, who is in prison now for the murder, well, he got himself an ear infection. But it wasn't by accident. You see, Alan planned for about a year to break out of jail. So he would pour his own urine into his ears to worsen a minor ear infection he had. So they transported him to a hospital. And they let him use the bathroom without anyone attending him. He had stowed away a little tiny uh, pick to pick the lock of his handcuffs. Then he proceeded to leave the restroom and beat the two prison guards. And he escaped. This is what he looked like around the time. Then through a series of carjacking, he eluded police. And he would be on the run for seven months. This here is the Miramichi River. It runs through New Brunswick. The reason why he's called the monster of Miramichi is because he would then commit four more murders kind of along the route of the river. On May 29th, 1989, he would murder Annie Flam. October 13th, 1989, he would murder a pair of sisters, Donna and Linda Donnie. He then set their house on fire after he killed them. November 16th, 1989, he then murdered a priest, Father James Smith. Why Alan Legere went on this murder spree, who knows, but he did it. It was a reign of terror that had everyone in the area terrified. No one would go out after dark. People were moving in with each other, but he was finally recaptured on November 24th, 1989. He would then be convicted of all four of those murders, and he would be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole still. However, he has been denied parole every single time. Between 1980 and 1981, the bodies of 11 children would be found throughout Vancouver, Canada. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Clifford Robert Olson. Viewer discretion is advised. Clifford Olson was born on January 1st, 1940 in Vancouver, British Columbia. Throughout his young years, he was a bully and a thief. He was always getting into fights at schools. He tormented poor innocent animals. He would drop out of high school and he would be arrested by age 17 for breaking and entering. What a great start to his life, huh? In December of 1980, in a remote, desolate location in Vancouver, the body of 12-year-old Christine Weller would be found. 
It appeared that she had been strangled and her cause of death was through some sort of sharp instrument. In September of 1981, another body was found, 13-year-old Colleen Dagnalt. Over the course of the following year, several more children would go missing. Body after body would be discovered in more remote locations throughout Vancouver. The victims were 12-year-old Christine Weller, 13-year-old Colleen Dagnalt, 16-year-old Darren Johnstrude, 16-year-old Sandra Wolfsteiner, 13-year-old Ada Court, 9-year-old Simon Partington, 14-year-old Judy Cosma, 15-year-old Raymond King, 18-year-old Sigrun Arnd, 15-year-old Terry Lynn Carson, and 17-year-old Louise Chartrand. Six of these victims were abducted and killed throughout just July of 1981. On August 12, 1981, Clifford would be arrested for attempting to kidnap two more young women. They were able to link him to the murder of Judy Cosma, and that's when police came to the conclusion that this string of child homicides was likely all by this man. The M.O. was the same, the cause of death was virtually the same. He had uh, sexually assaulted all of the victims, so eventually he would actually confess to being the serial killer. But many bodies had not been found yet, and Clifford wanted to strike a deal and it became known as the Cash for Bodies deal. He would give up the location to the remaining victims' bodies as long as the police gave $10,000 for each victim to his wife. Yeah, and police agreed to it. His wife received $100,000. <laughs> Unbelievable. Clifford scored 38 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist. Yeah, that checks out. He was convicted and sentenced to 25 years to life. He tried to get paroled many times, but lost. He died in 2011 in prison from cancer. You've heard of Dahmer, the Green River Killer, the Night Stalker, Eileen Warnos, but have you ever heard of Eiler? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Larry Eiler. Viewer discretion is advised. Larry was born on December 21st, 1952 in Crawfordsville, Indiana. He, of course, grew up in a battered home. His father and various stepfathers were all alcoholics who beat him and his siblings. Not only was he being beaten at home, but he was being beaten at school by many bullies. His mother would later take him to a psychologist where it would be determined that he had severe abandonment issues. But Larry would grow into an adult that seemingly was loved by everyone. His family and friends especially would just always go to bat for him. They said he is just this kind individual, he would do anything for anyone, he was goofy. But some devils are just that good at hiding who they truly are. By the late 70s, Craig had a very unique living situation going on. You see, he discovered he was gay back in his early teens, and he wasn't happy with it, but he accepted it. Well, he was living with a professor of his, Robert Little, who is also gay, but their relationship was allegedly platonic. At the same time, he was having a homosexual relationship with this man, John Dobrovolsky. He was also a married man with two children. His wife knew about his little gay relationship. In fact, she even let Larry Eiler live with them at times. Okay, now, so on August 3rd, 1978, Larry picked up a hitchhiker named Craig Long. Larry propositioned Craig. Craig said no. Larry got mad. Larry stabbed Craig in the chest. Craig survives. Unbelievably, the little cast of characters that Larry now has in his life, the professor and his lover, they would post his bail and get him out. They also managed to convince Craig Long not to press charges. Larry, who attempted murder, was now a free man. Between 1978 and 1982, Larold here would develop some urges, sadistic in nature, and he finally made those urges become reality in 1982. Between 82 and 84, Larry would go on to kill at least 21 young gay men. He would pick them up along the highway, which she became known as the Highway Killer. He would then bludgeon them to death and also stab them. All men were found with their pants and underwear around their ankles. Police would put together that this was the same person doing all of these murders. In September of 1983, Larry Eiler was pulled over for a routine stop when police discovered a basically a murder and kidnapping kit in his truck. They put two and two together and realized this is the highway killer. But his friends, once again, bailed him out. 
where he then killed and dismembered one more young man and put him into garbage bags. He was caught and arrested for that one. He was found guilty of that murder and was sentenced to death. He died of AIDS in prison in 1994. His lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, revealed he confessed to all 21 murders on his deathbed. They would brutally murder four young men and then casually go get some Philly cheesesteak. Oof, God, hello, true crimers. This is the highly requested case of Cosmo DiNardo. Viewer discretion is advised. Cosmo here was the oldest of four children in the DiNardo family. His mother, Sandra, and his father, Tony, they owned a construction business and were very, very well off. They would build their own home and they owned several properties. And by all accounts, the family was well respected in the community. They did good business and they didn't ruffle any feathers. They also owned a nice big farm property out in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And it's here where the carnage of our story takes place. Beginning in November of 2016, Cosmo DiNardo was being seen by a psychiatrist for schizophrenia and also bipolar disorder. At one point, he was actually fully committed into a psych ward, but he would eventually be released when he was fully medicated. In the year prior to this story, he had gone on several violent, I guess you can call them attacks. Just his overall nature was very scary to his family, especially his mother. And then a month prior to the story, the psychiatrist would say that his bipolar disorder was in remission. And he scaled back the medication. Whoops, not good, doc, not good. This young man was 19-year-old Jimmy Patrick. On July 5th, 2017, he would be lured to the DiNardo farm property by Cosmo with the promise of selling him up to $8,000 of marijuana. But that deal was all just a ruse. You see, God, son of a bitch. You see, Cosmo, off his rocker, lured the young man to this property where he shot him in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. And then he buried him on the property with a backhoe. And then I sh you not. The next day, Cosmo goes to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, ah, oh, he seems fine, not posing a threat to anyone. He lets him go, not knowing what he had just done the day before. Cosmo then enlists the help of his cousin, Sean Kratz. I have a history on this page with people with the last name Kratz. <clears throat> Sean agrees to help for some reason. Together, they lure three more men to the DiNardo farm property. 19-year-old Dean Finicaro, 21-year-old Tom Mayo, and 22-year-old Mark Sturgis. And using a 357 handgun, they just shot all three of them. Tom Mayo didn't die right away, so Cosmo ran him over with a backhoe, and then they buried all three of them. Then the two of them went and got cheesesteak. For real. God, that looks good. They got arrested trying to sell one of the victim's cars, and then authorities dug up the bodies. Both were convicted. Both got life in prison without parole. Serial killers are typically pretty consistent. They go by patterns and they go by the same M.O. But this one, yeah, he did not. Mm. Hello, true crimers. This is the case known as The Night Caller. Viewer discretion is advised. This frumpy fella is Eric Edgar Cook. He was born on February 25th, 1931 in Perth, Australia. This may come as a shocker, but he went through the childhood of a serial killer checklist. His father was a violent man, and he beat his children, he beat his wife. Papa was an alcoholic, yada yada yada, you know the drill. In his teenage years, Edgar here would do the typical vandalism, breaking and entering, petty theft. Hell, he even committed arson, and he would serve time in prison just for a few years. In 1953, he married his wife, 22-year-old Sarah, and they ended up popping out about seven kids. Edgar would spend more time in prison after committing auto theft. I assume you know where this is going now, right? Perth, Australia, between 1959 and 1963, Edgar turned it into his murderous playground. And when I tell you, this guy had no consistency. He would commit a series of hit and runs. He would break into homes in the middle of the night. He would stab. He would shoot. He would strangle. He would use knives. He would use scissors. He used an axe. Some of them were killed after they woke up when they discovered a man in their house. Some he killed while they were sleeping by shooting them. 
He simply knocked on one of their doors, and when they opened, he just shot them. One of the deceased victims, he... Uh, he had his way with one of the female uh, corpses. Some bodies he discarded, some bodies he left where they were, and his victims were Patricia Berkman, Brian Weir, he's the gentleman on the right front, John Sturkey, George Walmsley, Lucy Madrill, Shirley McLeod, Jillian Brewer, and Rosemary Anderson. He had no particular type. He killed men. He killed women. Eight of his victims would die, the eight I just showed, and 14 others he attempted to murder but failed. His crimes were so sporadic, so random, where none of them matched the previous ones that police actually arrested other men for some of the murders. Until police found one of the murder weapons, one of the guns, they swapped it out with another gun that didn't work in hopes that they would lure the real killer to come get the gun. And it did. He walked right into their trap, and then he confessed to all of them. Even the ones the police had no idea he did. Why? He was just batshit crazy, and he was executed by hanging 